this is my great honor to introduce you, uh, Kristina Tureka de Acero uh, from the University of Glasgow. And actually, she's now employed from yesterday mm -hmm. at the University of uh, Durham as a postdoctoral mm -hmm. fellow. Yep. So, congratulations. And also, she, it's, uh, 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 she's going to defend uh, her PhD very, very soon. So, it's uh, in the very stressful times that uh, she took the journey to. To, to North Shopping, it's very kind of you. And of course, uh, 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 it's it's very nice to, to have you here. Uh, uh, somebody who is uh, working on political polarization, uh, doing agent-based modeling and, uh, and online so offline social networks. It's uh, all topics that are interesting for, for, for the IS. And also uh, what, what you know about Christina is that she was the, she received the best student paper award of the, uh, the social simulation uh, conference at the uh, European so so Social Simulation Association. Uh, so congratulations, and it's, it's very nice to have you here. I hope uh, you enjoy, and uh, 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 the floor is yours. Thank you so much. I don't know how to blow up from that. It's like, <laughs> okay, well, thank you everybody online that's joined us, but also in person, although you cannot see them. There's quite a lot of people here, so you're all missing the biscuits. So next time, join us in person. <laughs> uh, and yes, Thank you very much for inviting. It is with great pleasure that I'll be presenting part of my research. So in front of you, I'll start sharing my screen. Um, any questions, feel free to pop them in the chat or stop me. I'll be able to see you. So, and thank you again for having me. So let me know how it works. Okay, you can see my screen. Yes, I was. So let's just test. I would. Yeah. Okay. Then you didn't see the screen. Right, so good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to my presentation about part of my PhD research, trying to understand the polarizing role of national identity and how it contributes to protest mobilization. But today's presentation, it will be focused on the first part, how do we get to the point of national identity polarization and the role that social networks as well as social media platforms play in this context. So first I'll start introducing the research background followed by the theoretical framework that I used to develop my agent-based model to explain how do social networks and social media platforms contribute to national identity polarization in a context where secessionist movements are present. Then I'll discuss the model implementation. I will get into the details and the mechanisms as well as the steps that the model follows to produce the results. And lastly, I'll introduce the future directions that I intend to carry at Durham University. So let's get started. Political polarization is not a new topic, and it has received significant scholarly attention during the last 10 years, and that attention has had a spillover effect on the media. Like we can see here, some headlines from the last couple of years of growing concerns about how people are becoming increasingly divided over their political opinions, their beliefs, and how that has eroded the social cohesion. But before we can get worried about polarization, we need to establish a definition, we need to conceptualize it. And the conceptualization that I use here is the Maggio's and colleagues 1996, whereby polarization can be both a state and a process. A state in the sense that it represents the opposed opinions in relation to a theoretical maximum. So you can all see my cursor. In a second, you shall be seeing my cursor just around here. I know the zoom choice. So here we can see, for example, in 2014, where the distribution looks very much like a bimodal with large proportion of people feeling either a Democrat or Republican and fewer individuals in the center. So that is at a fixed point, point we have polarization. But then we can conceive polarization as a process and it represents the changes of those opposed opinion about a given issue, belief, attitude, opinion over time. So this is what we're here, we're seeing here from 1994, 2004, and 2014. And by conceptualizing polarization as also a process, we are acknowledging the fact that it's a dynamical issue and that it might follow a nonlinear uh, pattern. And I will explain why that's relevant in a second. We also need to take into account the context in which this is happening, because increasingly social media platforms have become essential to our everyday lives, everyday discussions, and have made us uh, access to a lot of information, such as you currently joining me on Zoom in person. But for a lot of people, they are their primary source of news, meaning that they will get information from Twitter, Facebook, YouTube, whichever platform, and depending on the information they receive, they might change their opinions. And it has become increasingly possible for them to self-select the sources as well as the people they were exposed to. Hence the growing concerns, not just on the media, but also in, the, in academia 
about this polarization as it increases societal divisions. So the question that I'm asking myself in this research and mine more generally is, how do social media and social networks contribute to the emergence of national identity polarization? But why national identity polarization? Because seditionist movements aim to gain sufficient support to create a nation state of a given national identity. But in order to gather that support, they put national identity at the core of the movement. They might have grievances, they might be other things, but national identity remains at the center. And they ask individuals to choose from their dual national identities. Do you feel more Catalan than Spanish, more Scottish than British? And in doing so, they deepen the existing divisions over national identity. And this is problematic because if we were concerned about polarization, but we apply it to the context of national identity, this growing opposition over time can not only escalate the political conflict, but have consequences such as protest mobilization, which is a part that I'm happy to discuss, but I will not be covering into this presentation. I thought it would be useful to provide you with this graph from, that I created from data using uh, data from the Catalan Center for Opinion Studies on political attitudes. And it's a time series from 2011 until the most recent data in 2022. And this is showing us the responses of individuals to the question of national identity, which is usually known as Lenz Moreno question about dual national identity, where individuals can, can identify with a single or a dual national identity and something in between. And on the uh, y-axis, we see the proportion of individuals identifying with each of these categories. And if we pay closer attention to the 2011, which I chose because it's the start of the institutionalization process of Catalonia, the case study that I'm interested in exploring, we see that this purplish line at the top is the proportion of people that felt equally Spanish and Catalan, right? <laughs> on the fence, having a dual national identity. And we see that it's above 40%. But if we look, a little bit farther down, we see this pinkish line and ugly green line. And these are individuals that felt either more Catalan than Spanish or solely Catalan. So we're seeing people shifting towards that extreme. And then we see some people at the bottom that feel solely Spanish, but that proportion is not relevant. What we are seeing is if we have the people that feel more Catalan than Spanish and solely Catalan, it's actually over 50%. So we are in that polarization state that I, I explained earlier with vast amounts of people on one extreme, single national identity, versus those that felt in the center, right? And those were more likely to be against the event. But then if we look at polarization as a process, we see that over time, this proportion of people on either of these national identity values of survey would actually shift. So again, we're seeing that polarization as a protest. And we're interested in, in explaining how this process happened, because here these are just some events that happen throughout, but what we don't know is how this happens. We have multiple theories, we have data, but they are not enough to explain. Because polarization is a complex issue. It's not just the result of one single factor in isolation. So we need a perspective such as that of complexity science that provides us with the tools of representing this idea of polarization as a system constituted of interacting interconnected parts that can be the environment, the person itself, the media, the government, and many other factors, and how through these interactions of these interconnected parts, they bring about system level features such as polarization. And that is the ultimate goal, right? Explaining how this happens. Because then we can address, reduce it, or even prevent it, like again, the conflict escalation I was mentioning earlier. And the method that is most suited to answer this question is agent-based modeling, because it allows to simulate this and replicate this complex system idea and provide us with a tool to create an artificial society, that of, like that of Catalonia, where individuals interact with each other in their social networks, as well as with the media, and how through those interactions we observe or not that polarization, therefore providing us with a possible and plausible explanation. Because here, we're not interested in predicting right? There's too many assumptions and there's too many things we still don't know. But with what we know, with the theories that have already suggested how people interact with each other, how they change their opinion, can persuade each other, we can still tell something meaningful and actually quantify how each of these factors play a role. So the model that I am proposing here aims to, again, understand the role of social networks and social media and how do they contribute to the polarization of national identity. And the context to which we're applying this theoretical model is Catalonia, because again, we've seen that since 2011, there was polarization and it has continued throughout. So we want to explain that 
to try to address perhaps a decreased social cohesion in this context. And at the same time, we're able to obtain data from the Catalan Center of Opinion Studies, which means that we can compare the actual theoretical model to an empirical version one and to see how our theories with the mechanisms I'm about to discuss can actually be replicated with real world data. That is not calibration, but we'll get to that. And I thought it would be useful to put this little visualization here, as again, these are the two key components of this model. There could be more, but again, every model is a simplification of society and reality as well. So these are the ones that are concerning us here today. So at the bottom, we have social networks, and the main mechanism is social influence, through which individuals will shift their national identities. But that is motivated by the principle of the model, which states that individuals will tend to form connections with those they deem similar. So similarity in this model, for the purpose of this presentation, is concerned with national identity similarity. How much do our opinions, national identity values in this case, overlap? And the closer they are, the more likely to form a connection. Again, these are assumptions that will have implications for the resulting information testing as well as support numbers. At the same time, we have that social media environment that I was discussing earlier, where individuals discuss their opinions with other people, they expose to information, and that affects their national identity. But again, here we have two very interesting and important mechanisms, namely the filter bubble. Because there's vast amounts of information on social media platforms, we would expect that the information has to be filtered somehow. But the question is how you filter that information will have a direct impact on the information a person receives, engages with, and also subsequently updates their opinion, which might decrease selectivity, the, the option of information regarding opinions that might disagree with their views, and again, might promote polarization. So we need to take that into account. At the same time, we have this idea of echo chambers, which is contested in the literature, whether they exist, to what extent, and what is their influence. But still, we are assuming that they might exist in, key, in this context of online social networks, whereby following the principle of primophily, once again, individuals on social media platforms will not just select their friends, but also the sources of the information they're exposed to based again on similarity. So the expectation would be that on social media platforms, most of your friends will have similar attitudes and you will share information that agree with you. But again, there's hidden assumptions within that and I'll explain those in a second. So, my theoretical framework rests on four large pillars of the literature that I've really put here, but I'll go more in depth to explain how my model works. Because that's a challenge of it taking the theory of reality and abstracting it in a meaningful way and then getting the results to then make meaningful make meaningful answers from those data that you get. So each of these models are a tool that follows a bottom-up approach, meaning that it's mainly concerned with um, individual level interactions and how through the interactions of these individuals, as well as the environment they're in, they bring about the system level features. So we need to start from social influence which explain how individuals persuade each other and influence. Then we have network science and communication which tell us how people make connections, the importance of certain people in the network, and how that might promote information cascading and how we communicate. So that is the social media element as well. Then information cascading and opinion dynamics are the system level theories that explain the different patterns that after interacting with individuals and information in terms of sharing, like how far information will carry over, the importance of one person for um, sharing information, and as well for like opinion dynamics. So agent-based models have three key components, agents, the attributes of these agents, and the environment. So the agents are meant to represent the unit of analysis. And in this case, we're interested in Catalonia, and how national identity polarization emerges. So we're concerned with the individuals, people. And these people are bounded rationally because just like we are, we don't have all the information to make a decision and we often rely on heuristics. So, so do we and so do our agents. These lovely people here um, that I developed in the logo and the population of this agent-based model is 2,500 to correspond to the survey sample. So we can draw meaningful um, conclusions from the abstract model versus the empirically informed version. And just like people, our agents in this agent-based model have various attributes. And again, agent-based models rely on 
simplicity. So we need to keep it as simple as possible and use the bare minimum to explain the emerging phenomenon. And here we just need three key attributes to explain how social networks and social media platforms may contribute to polarization. The first one being national identity aptitude or value, which is comprehended between minus one and one, which matches the survey that I, that I showed you earlier, where individuals will feel either solely Catalan, more Catalan than Spanish, equally Catalan than Spanish, more Spanish than Catalan, solely Spanish, right? But in this case, it's continuous, so we can read it rather than uh, a nominal variable. And these properties are reflected here. See, it says not ID, and that's a value that is assigned. Then we have two very relevant parameters, namely uncertainty. And that is taken from existing opinion dynamics models, whereby it absolutely represents how easily persuadable or convinced is a person of their views, right? But what differences my model from previous models is that uncertainty is not a homogeneous value given to every agent, meaning every person has the same likelihood or be persuaded when they encounter information that agrees or disagrees with them. In my model, it follows a normal distribution because there's a diversity and heterogeneity in how likely is a person to change their opinion. So we cannot just assume that every person has the same likelihood. So in this way, we're introducing some realism some more realism to this model, right? So there'll be people that will be very, very convinced from their views, super centered, I will never change my opinion regardless of what you say, because there'll be other people that will be very, very easily convinced. And then the large proportion of people will be like a bit on the fence, let's say. Then we have engagement. And this parameter is relevant because it absolutely represents how social a person is. And this will have implications not just for in the information cascading, but also for opinion dynamics. And it's capturing the fact that, for example, on social media platforms, we have large proportion of people who are lurking, basically exposed to a lot of information and not actively sharing information, right? So their networks might not see it, but just because they're not sharing information doesn't mean that they are not updating their information, that they are not getting persuaded. So these are two separate processes and we need to account for both. So the engagement will represent how, how sociable they are and how engaged they are online. And again, it's drawn from a random normal distribution. Oh, sorry, that's a question. So what is the, the engagement, the point of having an engagement variable? What, what, is, what does it mean for someone not to be engaged or someone to be engaged compared to the outcome of interest? So that would influence their decision of sharing information. So if they are not engaged, they might get exposed to information from the media but if they are not engaged, they don't have an incentive to share it. And that means that their social networks will not be getting information from them. Okay. So they will be getting it directly mm -hmm. from the media. And this is very important because we're not just modeling social influence as a one-to-one -one person, but also there's a distinction. If you get information from the media, it might not have that social influence um, factor. Whereas if you are sharing information with me, because we have a social connection and our, our connection as nodes on the network is weighted, that might have an influence because, for example, I was going to use this example just in a second um, because it was coming next, so you were just very quick. Um, if your mom is sending you information about flat earth, you might be like, this bonkers, but it's your mom, right? So it's not just your colleague that you've spoken twice at the coffee machine, mm -hmm. it's actually your mom. So while you might not change your opinion, you might actually consider it. Whereas if you saw that on a random website on the internet, you might not think about it. So whether you are more or less engaged will also play a role in this. I hope that's clear. Yes, sir. Uh, also about the, the previous slide, mm -hmm. the national identity attitudes and the mm -hmm. uh, and the engagement. Do they also follow the uh, mm -hmm. the distributions from the sam uh, the survey or? So for engagement, we don't have data on that. So currently, it's a random normal distribution. But this is one of the thing, the challenges with agent based model that we don't always have real world data to inform our parameters. Mm -hmm. We have theories and assumptions that we have to make, but this is a very good start to see, is it engagement what is making the difference or is it actually the distribution, right? But um, in this case, national identity, I've made two versions of the model and I was gonna discuss them in a second. So don't worry, I'll call okay. this again. One with a random normal distribution, right? Our theoretical one of how the world works. And then the one with Catalonia's national identity data from 2011 that was polarized mm -hmm. to our understanding. 
And how do those, with the mechanisms that we have dealt in here, of how we communicate with this information, produce different outcomes? Mm -hmm. So, are there, I don't know if there are any questions you have. Oh, there's things in the chat, but are there any questions in the chat? No, no, no okay. uh, just like that. Right, not so really good. Okay, thank you. So, now we have our agents, we have their attributes. Where is this action taking place? At the model environment which is a weightless multi-layer multiplex network, which is more exciting uh, than what it is. But um, it's a multi-layer because it has two layers instead of one. And it's multiplex because the same nodes, uh, the nodes are representing the same entities. So they are the same people on both layers. And we have two layers because again, we're interested not just on our traditional social network, right? Like in person that we're having in this room, but also our online counterparts. And they follow two different distribute topologies. So the offline layer, which is the top one in purple here, follows a vast robust mobile network, which is informed with uh, data from Miranda Lubers and colleagues about Spain, and the average node degree was taken and scaled down from them. So it's empirically informed. Similarly, our online layer follows a different topology, because that's what the literature has found for online social networks. And it follows a Barabasa that's scale-free network. And we inform the average node degree from Robert Dunbar's and colleagues' work on social media platforms. Can you be? So the notes are at 2,500. In... Yes. Okay. Yeah. Yes. There's 2,500 notes. That's a lot of notes, and it's very annoying to visualize. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's one of the caveats that I was kind of covering at the end. But before we go in. But now there is a question in the chat. Oh, yes, sure. So why, why use two different network topologies? Does that work for, fine, if or does it introduce? Uh, um potential noise that impedes the performance of the ABM. Thank you for your question. Um I've not seen any issues by having two two layers. Uh I've I found that it was more realistic to introduce and separate because in NetLogo you can create two different types of links and connections. So it was rather straightforward to build those networks, but I could look into whether it produces some noise or not. I think this was just a starting point to try to make it more realistic to begin with. And this is what I intend to keep exploring with my current postdoc position, like the actual uh, importance of these networks. How do we build them? Are there more properties we're missing? Is it the network that is making a difference? So thank you for that. Um, There's one more. Oh yeah, sure. sure. <laughs> one That's more okay. question in the chat. It's uh, that if there is a, a, a node A, that yes. is not uh, represented yes. in the Yes, yes, I was just about to say it. So well done, person that noticed that. <laughs> so that was exactly my point. And that's why also we need these two networks. Because, well done, node A is missing. Why? Because not every person has social media platforms or wants to use them. So we don't have the same number of nodes online that we do offline. And we need to account for that because these people on the second layer, besides having their own connections with different ways, because they're different networks, they are the ones getting exposed to the filter bubbles. Whereas node A might not be getting exposed to the filter bubble directly through social net, social media, but they might be through social networks. So this is very important, subtle difference here. And also the ratio of online to offline social networks was also, got, was also drawn from data on internet use in Spain. Because again, we're talking about Catalonia. So I wanted to keep it as, as realistic as possible with the available data. Yes, you got a question. Yeah, I'm wondering about the Barabashi Arpet scale free to the online world. I mean, if that is goes to capture filter bubbles, wouldn't some kind of latent community structure be more appropriate? It could be, but I have not considered it. So, that, the world, so. I just thought that it would be good to start with the traditional Barabashi Arpet to see as a theoretical proof, and then we could look yeah, more yeah. specifically. Because at this point, I feel like the social networks in this model are means to an end. They are not the focus per se, which is what I want to continue doing because I realize that it's a really large part, but I don't want to spoil the, the, the results yet. Yeah, okay, uh, but no, I'll, I'll, I'll be more than happy to discuss that after the community section. Absolutely. No, um, it's a starting point, absolutely. And then we can shape the, the construct later on. Mm -hmm. yes. Okay, cute. Thank you. Um, so, yes. So, in this environment, we have the two layers, and because we have two layers, we also have two communication regimes, because it's not the same to share information in a one-to-one -one communication like we do offline, uh, this last dissertation, versus online, because if you use me, share, comment, like, anything on social media, all your networks will eventually see it on their feed. 
the information is reading will be very different online and offline. And this is a way of capturing that too. Should look at All right, so this is the model implementation. We can all look very faintly at the text on the screen, but don't worry, I'll be talking through it. So hopefully um, it will become clearer. So we have two decisions because again, we're interested in how the people engage with information, decide to share that information, and the resulting uh, of national identity changes. So the first of the two decisions in this model is whether or not to share information from the networks. So what I was just saying about the filter bubbles, if I have created two separate scenarios <clears throat> to test the effect of filter bubbles on the result of national identity dynamics. And there's one scenario where if the filter bubbles are present, we get biased information. That means that there's a larger proportion of information that there's a greater there, there's a great sorry there's a greater probability that an agent will receive information that agrees with their national identity, which is expected to reinforce their beliefs based on previous analysis models. So one thing is your probability, another thing is what happens that the probability is greater if the filter bubbles are present, that they are only affecting those that have an online person, which is 80%, sorry, I should have said 80%. So we have 2,000 nodes that are connected online and offline, but then we have 500 that aren't based on data from Spain. So if there's no filter bubble, then there's equal probability of getting information that supports and disagrees with your views. So after this, the agents, depending on their engagement, that's where the engagement element comes in place, they first compute the national identity similarity. And that is taken from the previous opinion dynamics, from the confidence of the dynamics models, very long, to see if the information that you just received, whether from the media or from a tie, is actually similar to you. And you calculate the degree of overlap. And in this case, if the overlap between my national identity attitude as an agent and the information I've just received is below a threshold, which is 0 0.5, which is the standard we use in opinion analysis models, but I've run sensitivity analysis in this, and I'll do that in a second. Then we consider that information similar to us. And we also need to take into account who are our social networks, right? So the topology is one thing, right? That is how many friends are we gonna have? How are we connected to each other? But also what is the national identity of our neighbors? Why is this important? Because social influence theories tell us that if we perceive to be in a minority, meaning that our national identity in this case is not shared by the group that we are connected with, then we're less likely to voice our opinions or share information that will disagree with us. And that is the contested spiral of silence mechanism that Noel von Neumann designed many years ago. And I still think it's relevant here, but I've signed a 20% of the time because we needed to give a number of how many times if you get information that disagrees with your group's national identity, you will share it. So that is not to say that you will never share information that disagrees with your network, but rather that the, the likelihood of you doing so against the majority view is rather small. So in this case, it's 20%, that sensitivity analysis should be run to see if actually is that 20% what's making a difference or is the actual mechanism, right? So if the information is similar and we are surrounded by similar others, we would just share the information if our engagement is above a threshold. Otherwise, we'll refrain from sharing information. So after we share information, what happens? We evaluate that information. So that's why we're having two separate things, because one thing is exposure, and another thing is internalizing that information and converting it and changing our national identity. And here we have two options. So if the agent receives information from the media, then we don't have that social influence component because of what I was saying earlier. If your mom tells you <laughs> that the earth is flat and sends you a news article about it, it's not the same that if you read it on a website. So if that information comes from a time, meaning that an agent in our network has shared that information, we will input that social influence because we have three types of social influence in this model. We have a simulative influence that says that if you receive information that agrees with your pre-existing beliefs, in this case, national identity, that will reinforce our opinions. We also have repulsive influence, whereas if we receive information that might disagree with our views, it might actually push us farther. But then we have the third one, third type of social influence, whereby we might receive information that disagrees with us, but because of that social influence, we might get persuaded in favor of the opposite opinion. So this is very interesting because again, 
if your mom is saying this, I'm not saying you're going to change your mind overnight and believe that the earth is flat now, but slower than alternatives, you might start shifting in that, in that direction. That is not to say you will, but there is an option there. So this leaves the door open for that potential to happen. And the implications of agents updating the national identity is that their group homophily, how many of my friends are similar to me will change. And that will again have an effect for our future sharing patterns, but also perception of our group homophily and opinion updating. I hope that makes sense. The partial page. No, we can go back. So with all this in mind, <laughs> I ran some parameter configurations, which is uh, an, ex an ex experiment setup in NetLogo, uh, whereby I had 4, 000, uh, 8,400 simulation runs, which are 100 uh, repetitions for a set combination of parameters, so they were average. And the output measures that were very interested were, again, polarization as a state and a process. So as a state, referring to the variance of national identity, a fixed point in time, and as a process, as the individual level change, that long time series I was discussing. So this is what I was mentioning earlier about national identity distribution. So by using Catalonia to ground this theoretical agent-based model, I was able to create two versions of this model, an abstract theoretical one where the distribution of national identity follows a random norm distribution, meaning small proportion of people feeling solely Catalan, small proportion of people feeling solely Spanish, and a large proportion of people feeling either way. Alternative to this are the 2011 data set where we clearly see that there is a skewness towards the left in this graph, whereby a larger proportion of people are feeling either solely Catalan, definitely more Catalan than Spanish, or equally Catalan than Spanish. And as we go towards the right end of the graph, which is minus one, less people are feeling Spanish. So we're comparing our initial conditions against these two distributions to see whether it is the distribution that's making a difference or is the agent interaction with the environment and each other that is bringing out the system level features. At the same time, and this is where it gets slightly confusing, we have two different initial social networks. So on the one hand, we have our modern environment, right? With two network layers following different topologies. But what changes here in this initial social network setup is, if we look at node I in the center, the, the homophily in the initial network. So we have a random one, whereby you have equal probability that your neighbors will share similar national identities, right? Whereas the homophilous one, you'll be surrounded by a majority of at least 70% of your neighbors sharing that national identity. So they are already encapsulated in that echo chamber. So again, we're testing the actual role of social networks. Does it make a difference who are your friends to begin with, or is it actually the information, or is it both? I hope that point is clear. Also, the blue belongs to Catalan, just in this case. I love to disfigure from being colleagues. And the orange looking one is Spanish. So we can see that like five out of six in this case are in favor of Catalan, like more Catalan than Spanish, same as I. Does that make sense? So topology goes on the one hand, and then the random initial social network is an independent thing. It's regarding national identity. Just because I know that there's also random networks as a topology, and that it's slightly confusing, but no, it has to do with national identity similarities. It's clear. And then the final hurdle is two different social uh, social media scenarios that will shape the media environment. One, where we don't have a filter, meaning there's an equal likelihood that you get exposed to information that agrees or disagrees with your national identity. And one, where like you primarily get information that supports your national identity. So again, you're getting that constant reinforcement. It doesn't mean that you are going to become more extreme, but it might. Are we clear up to that? Are there any questions? No? Right, so what are the actual outputs for this modeling? Spaghetti plots. So, yeah, I'll break down this, this massive figure. So, we'll look from left to right, top to bottom. So, on the left hand side, we have a combination of social, now, of, so, of social media filter bubble off. That means that individuals are exposed to random information, non biased, on the left. And on the right, we have filter bubble on. That means that they are primarily exposed to information that supports views. On the top row, we have homo initially homophilic social networks. That means that at the start of the simulation, you were primarily surrounded by individuals that share similar national identities. 
or a sudden one of the graphs will have a random initial social network, meaning that the national identity of your connections is random, not that the connections are random themselves. That depends on the topology. So what do we see? These are the results for the initially random distribution of national identity, meaning that we had very few people at the extreme, meaning at the top of one, corresponding to feeling Catalan, solely, and at minus one, feeling solely Spanish, and then larger proportion of people feeling Indonesian, right? So this is our ideal distribution, theoretically formed. And what we already see is that just looking from left to the right, so filter bubble off to filter bubble on, there's a clear difference. And what we see is that polarization is converges. But this is very interesting because despite of starting from different social networks, whether you're surrounded by similar others or not, because you're getting exposed to information that agrees and disagrees with you, there's actually very few extremists because the extremists that started at minus one and one are actually drawn towards the center as there is no information or people that share their beliefs. So there's no incentive for them to become more extreme, to become more polarized. But as if we look at the so the bubble on, we see a slightly different picture, especially when the initial social networks are homophilous, meaning you're surrounded by friends that support your national identity, as well as information that will agree with those views. So what we see is rather like it spans towards either side and it's slowly becoming more polarized, very slowly, but it's not a clear picture. Again, it's, uh, yeah, it's, a, it's, it's an explanation for why could this happen. But it's when we actually look at data from Catalonia that the picture becomes slightly more clear. So we again see that when there's no filter bubbles, there's a shift from the extremes, right? All these people that felt either only Catalan, more Catalan than Spanish, start to shift. But we see it's a rather slower transition when we have an initially homophilous social network because we're still connected to people who agree with our views, right? But because we're getting information that disagrees with our views, the people that are closer to that information slowly start to shift in favor of that towards the center, right? And less of our friends are similar to us. So we were at the start on the extreme, but we're slowly being persuaded. That's what we see is slow fluctuation over time. Whereas if we start from a random network, because we're in a mixed network and we're getting mixed information, meaning there's no similarity necessarily in national identity, could be in favor, could be against, it's much easier for that conversion to emerge. So we are already seeing that the initial social network as well as the filter bubble might be playing a role. But it's actually this one, the homophilus and filter bubble, and that is the most exciting. Why? Because here we're seeing that the people that were initially identifying as solely in Catalan, these people maintain that extremism. Why? Because they're surrounded by primarily people that support their national identity as well as information. So they are not becoming more extreme, but rather maintaining that extremism. And it's actually them who are drawing the people that felt just a little bit more Catalan than Spanish mm -hmm. towards either direction. And this is the very interesting thing because existing opinion dynamics photos are showing that by model distribution with everybody on the extremes, nobody in the center. But here, this is one we're not seeing. We're still seeing like, a decent amount of people that stick to their guns and stay in the middle, that don't want to shift in favor of just feeling Catalan or feeling equally Catalan and Spanish, these darker areas here and at the top. And then some people that still maintain feeling solely Spanish. So it's very interesting because, again, we're seeing how these people split. And these are the people we should be concerned about because these are the people in the center willing to listen to either side. So we start from popular social network as well as social media platform filter bubbles promoting information that increases polarization, but it's not that scary polarization of the bimodal distribution, but rather slow but continuous shift in favor of either option. And then for the random network, uh, initial social network, sorry, we see a more or less similar picture with again an initial shift from those that felt solely Catalan towards more Catalan, but then they slowly go back into the extremism. So we see what something happens in opinion dynamics models where initial eight as extreme as the extremist of their friends. So they cannot go beyond how extreme my friend is, but I can shift in that direction. But again, I hope this are clear moments. What? What are the conclusions? What are the implications from this? 
that the network configuration affects the polarization of national identity that is actually in the presence of social media filter bubbles that it actually promotes that attitude polarization, not as extreme, but equally concerning, because we're seeing how these people, in the special case of Catalonia, are shifting in either end, which is what I initially showed on that uh, time series. So although time is abstract in this model, it still is able to explain, to some extent, just by pattern validation, how individuals will shift from either being more Catalan towards solely Catalan or towards either Catalan or Spanish. And this has implications for conflict explanation. So where do we here? future directions is to focus more on the social network. This is the work that I intend to carry out at Durham University, where the idea is to generate socially realistic synthetic networks that have more than one network property in a single algorithm, which will allow us to exactly observe, not just if we start from the average no degree, but like cluster coefficient, assortativity coefficient, centrality, all these measures into one algorithm that we can explore those networks and apply it to contexts like mine, because we're seeing that it's not just the information that you're receiving, but actually who are you connected with and how these people interact with is making a difference for the overarching national identity polarization. So we need better tools and we have sufficient data to apply it to this. And as a result, we'll create more realistic social networks for simulation, not just mine, but could also be used for COVID, for inequalities, and for many other things. Now we're more than happy to discuss this. So hopefully there's no more questions. Thank you very much for listening. And these are my email addresses, and I'll be more than happy to take any questions. Thank you so much. Should I pause the screen, maybe? Uh, yes, and I also stop the recordings.